Hey, Mark DuPont here, and I have the privilege of doing today's devotional on Psalm 103. Psalm 103 is not only a very powerful psalm, but for me it has personal deep meaning that I'll share towards the end of this devotional. I'm going to basically break it down to five sections, talking about uh, the first five, six verses about the content or the main theme of this, but then secondly, talking about the character of God, a third section talking about the redemptive actions of God, and lastly, the call to worship God. The first six verses or so all have to do with setting the contents for this, just the amazing love and the thoroughness of God's salvation in our lives. Verse 1 and 2 read, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits. God calls us to worship him, not just giving, as Isaiah talked about, lip service, just singing the words, but for our, with our whole soul and our whole mind. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And as we face uh, challenges in life, but also as we think about God, it's so important that we don't do it with the mindset of the world, but we do it with the mind of Christ. And so it behooves us to, to think about God according to his word, what he says about himself, his characteristics and his ways. And so when difficult situations, we don't despair, we don't give in to hopelessness, but we know that God is there. He's watching over us. And so we worship the Lord with our, not only our words, but with our hearts and our souls, our minds and our emotions as well involved in that. Verse 3 reads, Who forgives all your iniquity and heals you of all your sins. And this is really speaking again of the thoroughness of the Lord's salvation. He wants to redeem every area of your life. It's not just your eternal life where you're going to spend eternity at, heaven or hell, but it's a question of he wants to release his goodness, his truth, and his ways, his kingdom into every relationship, into your thought life, into your emotions, and even into your physical body. This is why we believe on laying hands on the sick and praying for people, because God is Jehovah Rapha. He is the Lord God who heals. Uh, verse 4, he redeems your life from the pit. And uh, that's a common, uh, something that's mentioned a couple of times in this, in this uh, uh, psalm. And that a pit at that time was a metaphor for being absolutely stuck in a place where there was no help other than God's divine intervention. He satisfies you, verse 5 reads, he satisfies you with good so your youth is renewed like the eagles. And if you've ever read about an eagle soaring, that at times they'll just lock their wings and they'll catch updrafts and they can actually soar, moving in circles in different directions for hours on end. And it just speaks not only about a strength, but their ability to rest in what they were created to be. So you and I are called to rest in the goodness of God. And verse 5, he satisfies you with good um, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The next few verses really talk about the character of God and, and some of the aspects of his nature. Verse 6, the Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. When God spoke himself to Moses on the mountain, he said, I'm a God of compassion and grace, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and truth. And sometimes we are uh, provoked to sympathy. We empathize with the hurting person. But compassion is very different than that. Compassion is like a, almost like a word of knowledge from God's heart that compels you to take action that's going to have a real impact in people's lives. There are some eight or nine stories in the Gospels where Jesus had compassion upon hurting, diseased people, and because of that, he healed them. And sympathy can go both ways. Sympathy can be positive. It can result in some positive good works. But also, sometimes people sympathize victims in, in the wrongful way. And we see a lot of things on social media, and a lot of things have been in the news the last uh, couple of months, in that people are expressing sympathy for victims or people in difficult situations. But sometimes that sympathy leads to an unhealthy reaction. The compassion on God not just wants to reach out and help us, but wants to bring change, healing, wholeness to our lives. God loves us just the way we are. 
but he wants to change the way we are. He wants to bring us into a living conformity to the image of Christ Jesus. And sometimes we look at victims, say, oh, you poor dear, you just, you know, you're okay. Just don't, you don't need to do anything. You don't need to change. We're going to take care of you. But the compassion of God sometimes calls us to repent and change so he can bring us into, just as I said, a living reflection of Jesus. Verse 7, he made known his ways to Moses and his, but his acts to the people of Israel. And this is a little bit reflected in Psalm 114, verse 2. Judah became a sanctuary, but Israel his dominion. It's one thing to believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. It's a real, another thing to really know him in your heart of heart, that he is your Lord, he is your Savior, he is your best friend. And God wants a people that are not just after a salvation and blessings, but God wants a people who are after his heart, just as we want people who not just want things from us, but our hearts as well. Verse 8, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding, steadfast love. Verse 9, he will not always chide uh, or rebuke us, nor will he keep his anger forever. Sometimes, as I said, when we end up in a pit, the question is, should not be, will God save us or when will he save us or deliver us? But what are the lessons he's trying to teach us? Why has he allowed us or why have we stumbled into this? He does not deal with us according to our sins, verse 10, nor repay us according to our iniquities. Verse 11 through 16 or so, we're going to talk, uh, actually verse 19, we're going to talk about the actions of God as redemptive actions. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. And I just want to say a couple of things uh, about the fear of the Lord. It's not something that's commonly talked a lot about today in the body of Christ. Fortunately, we do at Foothills because uh, we, it's very biblical. But a lot of times people say God is love, but they have a very shallow perception of the love of God. Just again, that, that kind of false sympathy. You're okay, I'm okay, and you know we just need to kind of be nice, to, but no. God's love, his compassion is just overwhelming and he is so powerful that he calls us in a healthy way to not only love him with all our hearts, but to fear him. In fact, the beginning of wisdom, Proverbs says, is to fear God. That's not a fear that can, should compel us to run away from him, but a fear that should compel us to seek him and want to lay down our lives before him and say, Father, not my ways, your, your ways, because he really does know what's best for us far more than we can have any idea. And he is the one when no one else can get us out of the pit. He's the one who can lift us out of there. Verse 12, as far as from the east is from the west, as so far above does he remove our transgressions from us. Paul said something very powerful in Philippians chapter 3, verse 13. He said, I do not consider that I have made it on my own, that I've really achieved it yet, when it talks to righteousness, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. And if you can picture of a, of a runner, of a sprinter, just about to cross that finishing line, they're straining, they're giving it, they're all in all right to cross that line, they're leaning forward into it. And that's what we're called to do, to focus on Jesus, to focus on the finish line. We all have made mistakes, but sometimes it becomes a terrible trap when we remain focused on our mistakes of the past. When God says that if you've repented, if you've let go of that, you've changed, I've separated your sins as far as from the east as from the west. Verse 13 on, as the Father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion on those who fear him. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. And as for man, his days are like grass, he flourishes like a flower of the field, for the wind passes over it, and it is gone, and his place knows it no more. God knows what we're made of, and he knows we need our help. He is a very present help in a time of trouble. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to his children's children. When he begins to do things in your life, your spouse's life, your family, it just sets up this incredible uh, downward flow that go on to attack generation after generation when we surrender our lives to him. 
Verse 18, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. Verse 19, the Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. Verse 20 through 22, bless the Lord, O you his angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, and his ministers who do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works, and in all places of his dominion, bless the Lord, O my soul. And I just want to challenge you that, you know, we're all being affected in different ways by the season of COVID-19. There's a certain amount of isolation. For some people, there's very much of a fear factor, not only of the sickness itself, but also of their career, the finances. Are they going to have a job to go back to? But in the midst of this, God calls us to worship him. And I can remember three years ago when I went through a very serious health issue that lasted for about 10 months. And in the midst of that, just every day I would pray and worship the Lord with those first five verses here in Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Uh, and uh, forget, nah, nah. bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits. He not only heals you of your, uh, forgives you of all your iniquities, but he heals you of your afflictions. He redeems your life from the pit. He crowns you with loving kindness, and he renews your youth like the eagle. And I want to challenge you, especially if you're going through a challenging time right now, worship your way out of it. Just renew your mind in the promises of God. Give yourself to him. And as David said, wait patiently and he will lift you up out of that pit and set your feet upon the rock of Jesus.